Hey, what is up guys? Mr. The Reverts here, and in the video you are about to watch is the full conference call that was held yesterday by Activision Blizzard. And in this conference, they gave a lot of information regarding Call of Duty, Overwatch, and some other really, really great games. And I'm gonna throw in some timestamps down in the description if there's something you wanna hear specifically, or you can just skip my part of the commentary and go straight into the conference, but I won't take too much of your time. Just really quick, basically, regarding Call of Duty 2018, there weren't any teases or reveals if that's what you were looking for, but the Activision higher-ups kept on mentioning Black Ops and how the series is the most successful sub-franchise in Call of Duty history, and they also acknowledged that Black Ops has a huge fan base, which I guess could potentially be a sign of what's to come for this year's Call of Duty game. Honestly, if you ask me though, this kind of stuff did boost my sureness factor of COD 2018 being a part of the Black Ops series, but uh, you can make the decision for yourself. This is just what we have so far. Definitely sometime in April or or May is when we start getting teases and that kind of stuff regarding COD 2018. But also one more thing that stood out to me was during last year's call, Activision just came out straightforward and said that the next Call of Duty game will be boots on the ground, but specifically traditional combat. But this year there was no word on whether or not this year's game will have jetpacks, will it be boots on the ground, we didn't get any clues at all. So take that how you want guys. I'm going to leave you to the rest of the video, shout out to the Adjuter for recording the event, so uh, check his links down below if you guys want to and enjoy. Stand by. Good day and welcome to Act the Activision Blizzard's Q4 2017 earnings call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Amrita Ahuja, Senior Vice President of, <coughs> of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for Activision Blizzard's fourth quarter 2017 conference call. With us are Bobby Kodak, CEO, Cotty Johnson, President and COO, and Spencer Newman, CFO. And for Q&A, Dennis Durkin, Chief Corporate Officer, Mike Morheim, CEO of Blizzard, Eric Hirschberg, CEO of Activision, and Ricardo Zacconi, CEO of King, will also join us. I would like to remind everyone that during this call, we will be making statements that are not historical facts. The forward-looking statements in this presentation are based on information available to the company as of the date of this presentation, and while we believe them to be true, they ultimately may prove to be incorrect. A number of things could cause a company's actual future results and other future circumstances to differ materially from those expressed in any forward-looking statements. These are the risk factors discussed in our SEC filings, including our 2016 annual report on Form 10-K and those on the slide that are showing. The company undertakes no obligation to release publicly any revisions to any forward-looking statements to reflect events or circumstances after today, February 8, 2018. <coughs> we will present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures during this call. We provide non-GAAP financial measures, which exclude the impact of expenses related to stock-based compensation, the amortization of intangible assets, expenses including legal fees, costs, expenses and accruals related to acquisitions, including the acquisition of King Digital Entertainment, expenses related to debt financings and refinancings, restructuring charges and tax benefits of these excluded items, along with significant discrete tax-related items, such as those resulting <coughs> from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act enacted in December 2017. These non-GAAP measures are not intended to be considered in isolation from, as a substitute for, or superior to our GAAP results. We encourage investors to consider all measures before making an investment decision. Please refer to our earnings release, which is posted on www.activisionblizzard.com for a full gap to non-GAAP reconciliation and further explanation with respect to our non-GAAP measures. There's also a PowerPoint overview, which you can access with the webcast and which will be posted to the website following the call. In addition, we will also be posting a financial overview highlighting both GAAP and non-GAAP results and a one-page summary sheet. Starting this quarter, we are introducing a new operating metric, net bookings. Net bookings is defined as the net amount of products and services sold digitally or sold in physically in the period and is equal to revenues plus the impact from deferrals. <clears throat> and now I'd like to introduce our CEO, Bobby Kodak. Thanks, Amrita, and thank you all for joining us today. This was a record quarter and a record <laughs> year for Activision Blizzard. We delivered record quarterly net bookings of $2.6 billion and record annual net bookings of $7.2 billion. We delivered record segment operating income of $2.4 billion 
and record non-GAAP EPS of $2.21 a share, above our initial February outlook of $1.70. We also delivered record annual operating cash flow of $2.2 billion. Each part of our business reached new milestones and demonstrated the durable and enduring nature of our franchises. Activision celebrated strong Call of Duty momentum and their best operating income year ever. Blizzard delivered their highest operating income ever for a year with no major game releases, and King returned to growth with the Candy Crush franchise stronger than ever. 2017 was also an important year for us in, for preparation of our future growth initiatives. We invested in new services, features, content, and experiences to connect and engage audiences all across our franchises. And one example is the launch of the Overwatch League. Witnessing the passion of players at the opening matches at Blizzard Arena and the millions of spectators connecting via live stream from around the world was a thrilling moment in our history and a milestone in esports growth. Watching fans road trip across the country, spectators in the stands wearing team jerseys, heroes in the game wearing team skins, audiences leaping to their feet after daring play and viewing parties around the world. These were awesome moments that created an incredibly rewarding experience and demonstrated the emergence of professional competition as a way to celebrate our players. Launching a professional league is an ambitious undertaking, and our teams executed on countless fronts. Attracting 12 world-class team owners representing cities in Asia, Europe, and North America, signing numerous league and team level sponsors, bringing esports spectating and production values to new heights, and forming a media distribution strategy that provides broad reach and fair value for our premium content, while also preserving distribution on own platforms. Overwatch League matches are broadcast live on our MLG network and Twitch and will be available on other broadcast outlets throughout the world. In its first week, the League reached 10 million unique viewers and had more than 280,000 average viewers on a per minute basis. In the week since, we've seen sustained levels of viewership globally with new spectators joining each week as the excitement continues to grow. Of course, we're building this League for the long term. And we're pleased with the early strong momentum that we have, which has created value for players, spectators, team owners, partners, and sponsors. Our efforts have already led to increased global demand for expansion teams, which we would expect to start selling later this year. We also believe in the growth potential of each new opportunity we are pursuing, whether in-game advertising, consumer products, cinematic productions, or esports, all of these support our communities and help to drive engagement with our franchises. Each new experience we provide that enables our players to demonstrate their passion creates a virtuous cycle of engagement, investment, and growth. It's still early days for many of these efforts, but making progress in these strategic growth areas will be an important focus for us in 2018 and beyond. I have the privilege to lead one of the best teams in the entire business world, and as I begin my 28th year at the helm, I've never been more energized to pursue with focus and determination the great growth opportunities that lie ahead. Also this quarter, we announced that Ravita Bowers joined our board of directors. Ravita brings an immense amount of experience and leadership from education and media institutions, such as Common Sense Media, where she chairs the national board of directors, and from the Walt Disney Company, where she served as a director for 10 years. We're thrilled to have her as our newest board member. And now, here's Cotty to review the highlights of our operations this quarter. Thank you, Bobby. Activision Blizzard had a record year, and throughout 2017, we broke records and posted strong results each quarter by providing an <coughs> ongoing year-round stream of content, services, features, and events, both large and small, to our passionate and deeply engaged communities. While achieving these records, we also made important investments to drive future growth. We invested in marketing to grow our franchise reach, in new services and features to enable more audience engagement and player investment, and in new growth verticals to celebrate our fans. Let's dive into our first strategic pillar audience reach, which was 385 million monthly active users this quarter, up from 384 million in Q3, starting with King. On our last call, we discussed a number of initiatives under underway to stabilize King's user base. Those ongoing efforts include releasing fresh and compelling features, events, and content into the live games, ROI-positive marketing to attract and engage new players, 
and a strong pipeline of new titles to expand the network. Several of these initiatives enabled King to finish Q4 with 290 million monthly active users and to grow time spent per user to a record of 37 minutes. The Candy Crush franchise in particular was up in monthly active users quarter over quarter, while also driving increased engagement with higher daily active users and higher time spent per player. Activision had the top two grossing console game releases in North America and two of the top five worldwide, leading to 55 million monthly active users in Q4, up double digits quarter over quarter and matching the prior quarterly record. Call of Duty World War II was the top grossing console game worldwide in 2017, making it the number one franchise globally, a spot the franchise has held for eight of the last nine years. Call of Duty World War II also set a new franchise milestone with the biggest launch quarter sell-through on current-gen consoles, higher even than Black Ops 3. The game also set a PlayStation record as the biggest day one digital release ever. We've seen a steady march upward on full game downloads for Call of Duty over the last several years, and there's plenty of runway still ahead. All of this strong performance, coupled with a great Black Ops 3 digital season earlier in the year, means that the most successful video game franchise of the last 20 years continues to be healthy and vibrant and will carry strong momentum into 2018. To that end, this, this fall, we plan to continue to exceed fans' expectations with a new release from Activision's Treyarch, the creators of Black Ops, the most successful sub-franchise in Call of Duty history, and we cannot wait to share more about that with you on future calls. Turning now to Destiny. Destiny 2 had an impressive launch, highly rated and second only to Call of Duty as the highest grossing console release in North America in 2017. It added a critically acclaimed PC version with distribution on Blizzard's Battle.net, and the attach rate on Destiny 2's first expansion, released in December, was higher than that of Destiny 1's. That said, we haven't yet sustainably expanded the Destiny community, but Bungie is hard at work improving the game. And the good news is that the Destiny community is a deeply committed, vocal, passionate player base that has responded well in the past when we've made improvements based on their sentiment. To that end, last week, Bungie released an update outlining both the changes we've made and the changes that are coming. So far, these changes have been received positively, and the team has a robust slate of services, features, and seasonal events still to come. There are also two epic adventures on the horizon, with Expansion 2 in May and a major content launch later this year. There is magic in this franchise, and we're committed to meeting our own and our players' expectations in the coming quarters. Crash Bandicoot continued to have strong sales in Q4 after a successful summer launch. Crash's performance shows how valuable our library of IP can be, and brought back to players in a compelling new way. We look forward to exploring other beloved IP in future offerings as well. Blizzard is celebrating its 27th anniversary today. Happy birthday, Blizzard. <laughs> a lot of things have changed over the past 27 years as the business has grown across genres, platforms, and geographies, but a few things have not, including Blizzard's commitment to put players first and to release games at an incredibly high level of quality. Blizzard finished the year with 40 million monthly active users, continuing a six-quarter streak of 40 million monthly active users or more. Overwatch continues to attract new players, and the most recent Blizzard World content has been well-received by the community. Overwatch's model of delivering year-round content with seasonal events, new heroes, and new maps continues to drive strong engagement. Hearthstone's monthly active users increased year-over-year year this quarter as players enjoyed the latest expansion, Kobolds and Catacombs, and the introduction of new free content. <clears throat> While net bookings did not match the prior expansion's record performance, players did log more playtime, which brings me to our second strategic pillar, deepening engagement. For Activision, Blizzard, and King overall, daily time spent per user was over 50 minutes for the second quarter in a row, placing us on par with Facebook's time per day across Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger. Now, that 50 minutes per day is just the time spent in our games. It does not include the growing popularity of watching our games on other online platforms. For the year, Activision Blizzard had seven of the top 20 games on Twitch. The next closest publisher had just two, demonstrating the broad esports appeal of our franchises. Bobby already shared that launching the Overwatch League was a key milestone for us, and that we're seeing strong early momentum. And Call of Duty World League also opened its next season in December and is off to a good start, selling out each of its World League Global Open events. And the season's launch event more than doubled viewership hours over the prior year. Turning now to our third pillar, player engagement. In-game services, features, and content continue to engage our fans and help drive our results, delivering a Q4 record of over $1 billion of in-game net bookings and an annual record of over $4 billion. 
We focus on offering compelling content for our communities wherever they play. Activision has some of the industry's best-selling downloadable content in 2017, including Zombies Chronicles for Call of Duty Black Ops 3, which was the number one add-on offering of the year for PlayStation North America. This is notable and impressive given that Chronicles came out nearly two years after Black Ops 3 launched and illustrates the value of releasing great content to our engaged communities wherever they are playing. Just as impressively, player investment in additional virtual goods and services surpassed investment in downloadable content in 2017 for Call of Duty and for Destiny, and we expect that to be the same for 2018. Activision has a great digital roadmap ahead, including Destiny 2's expansion pass and Call of Duty World War II's season pass. King was the biggest contributor to our record year of in-game net bookings. King continues to have two of the top ten grossing games on U.S. iOS and Android app stores, a level of performance they've delivered for over four years now. For the first time, King actually held both the number one and the number two spots at the same time with Candy Crush Saga and Candy Crush Soda Saga, respectively, demonstrating the remarkable durability of the Candy Crush franchise. Overall, King had an incredible year in 2017, delivering not only four straight quarters of growth in consumer spend on Candy Crush, but also new mobile net bookings records with their biggest year, their best quarter in Q3, and their best week ever in Q4. Finally, we continue to make progress on our company-wide mobile pipeline. We are hard at work on initiatives across a number of our franchises. We plan to see some early results later this year and for the bulk of our new mobile opportunities to be driving growth in 2019 and beyond. In summary, 2017 was our best year yet because of the broad-based success we delivered and because of the groundwork we laid to realize significant growth in years ahead. We have a great slate on the way for 2018 and beyond. And we look forward to continuing to serve our passionate fans, communities, and audiences around the world. Spence will now review the 2017 numbers in more detail and discuss 2018 guidance. Spence? Thanks, Cotty. So today I'll review our Q4 and 2017 results, as well as our outlook for 2018. Q4 was another strong quarter capping off a record-setting year. With record quarterly and annual revenues, driven by record annual digital revenues, as our business is now 78% digital, and record in-game revenues consistent with our entertainment as a service model. With an increasingly diversified business, we generated for the first time over $2 billion in annual revenues on each of three interactive platforms, console, PC, and mobile. And with record profits, record annual non-GAAP operating income and earnings per share, and record cash flows. Each of Activision, Blizzard, and King contributed to our overperformance for the year delivering record annual total segment revenues and operating income. And as Bobby noted, this was without the benefit of a new full game release from Blizzard, underscoring the strength of our continuous engagement model. Activision had an impressive fourth quarter capping off their best year ever, with segment records for operating income of over $1 billion and operating margin of over 38%. Activision's performance was driven primarily by the resurgence of the Call of Duty franchise with the successful launch of Call of Duty World War II, as well as strong sales for Crash Bandicoot. Q4 segment revenues and operating income increased 16% and 32% over prior year, respectively, with the full year growing at similarly strong rates. King had an outstanding year, with revenue and operating income up 7% and 12% respectively, on a pro forma basis that includes the 2016 pre-acquisition period for King. This is a major accomplishment. It's testament to the strong execution of the King team, their increased prioritization on the Candy Crush franchise and other live titles, and their intense focus on leveraging their platform to drive continuous improvements in engagement, game features, and player investment. While margins expanded year over year, we did see some compression in Q4 as King strategically invested in marketing live titles to profitably drive reach. Blizzard also delivered. At $2.1 billion of revenue and $712 million of operating income, Blizzard generated record results for a year with no major game release, fueled by a steady stream of content and events across their franchises, in particular Overwatch, Hearthstone, and World of Warcraft. Revenue, operating income, and segment operating income margin were down year over year as expected given the difficult comp to last year's World of Warcraft expansion and Overwatch release. We did see some incremental margin and compression in Q4, 
primarily due to additional marketing initiatives. Nonetheless, with 33% full year OI margins, the team did a nice job delivering the core business while investing in key growth initiatives across the Overwatch League, mobile incubation, and MLG network. Now, before I turn to our consolidated results and 2018 guidance, a brief note on U.S. tax reform. Our 2017 GAAP results include incremental expense of $794 million due to the impact of significant, discrete, tax-related items primarily related to the impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act enacted in December of 17. The charge related to tax reform is a reasonable estimate, but is preliminary and includes a one-time tax on accumulated overseas profits and the revaluation of deferred tax assets and liabilities. As a result of U.S. tax reform, we expect a reduction in our future effective tax rate, which we will reflect in our 2018 guidance. We'll also now have repatriation opportunities for our international cash that enable more efficient global cash management and capital structure flexibility. So now let's turn to our consolidated results. Unless otherwise indicated, I'll be referencing non-GAAP figures. Please refer to our earnings release for full GAAP to non-GAAP reconciliations. For the quarter, we generated record GAAP revenues of $2.04 billion, $343 million above our November guidance. This includes the net deferral of revenues of $597 million. As already mentioned, this quarter we are introducing a new operating metric, net bookings, which were a record $2.64 billion. We had a gap loss per share of $0.77, cents, including a $1.03 expense from the impact of the significant discrete tax-related items that I just mentioned. Adjusted to exclude these discrete tax-related items, we would have delivered earnings per diluted share of $0.27 cents, ahead of our guidance of $0.10. Cents. <clears throat> we had non-GAAP EPS of $0.49 cents in Q4, ahead of guidance of $0.36, cents, and both GAAP and non-GAAP EPS figures include net deferrals of $0.45. Cents. For the year, we generated record GAAP revenues of $7.02 billion. That's $1 billion above our initial 2017 guidance. This includes the net deferral of revenues of $139 million. Net bookings were a record $7.16 billion. We generated GAAP EPS of $0.36, cents, which includes a $1.04 expense from the impact of discrete tax-related items in Q4. Excluding the discrete tax-related items, we would have delivered record GAAP EPS this year of $1.39, ahead of initial guidance last February of $0.72. Cents. We generated record non-GAAP EPS of $2.21, ahead of our initial guidance last February of $1.70. These figures include net deferrals of $0.07. Cents. So now looking at cash flow and capital structure, our strong business performance for the year also delivered record annual operating cash flow of $2.21 billion and Q4 operating cash flow of $1.16 billion, finishing the year with approximately $4.8 billion in cash and investments. With regard to capital structure, we had some positive developments throughout the year and continue to take a balanced approach overall. In Q2, we received another upgrade from S&P to B and entered into a leverage neutral $1.2 billion refinancing that locked in attractive long-term interest rates. We paid down $500 million in debt and finished the year with approximately $4.44 billion of aggregate debt outstanding. And we increased our annual dividend 15% to 30 cents paying out $226 million to shareholders in May. Now we're heading into 2018 with a strong balance sheet and additional flexibility. We ended the year with a net cash position of $335 million. And as discussed, the recent tax reform allows us to repatriate the cash we're holding overseas more efficiently. This year, we'll once again take a balanced approach to capital allocation. Our board has authorized a 13% increase in our dividend to $0.34 cents per share, payable in May, and further debt pay down of over $1 billion. In addition, our $1 billion stock repurchase authorization remains in effect for another year. <clears throat> now, uh, let's turn to our outlook for 2018, but before doing so, um, and before I review the numbers, I wanted to quickly discuss ASC 606 and its impact on our guidance. 
While ASC 606 will affect our gap revenue recognition, it's not expected to materially impact our annual segment results, cash flows, or financial performance as reviewed for internal management purposes. We do expect that there will be some quarterly movements within the year, so please refer to the investor FAQ we have provided on our website for more information on ASC 606. Now turning to our 2018 slate. From an operating income perspective, we expect each of our segments to grow in 2018, while we also continue to invest in new releases, mobile pipeline, and our future growth initiatives, including advertising, esports leagues, and MLG network. We expect in-game revenues to be a primary driver of our growth for both the top and bottom line. Coming off a record year in 2017, we expect in-game net bookings to grow by a double-digit percentage in 2018 as we continue to innovate and deliver more engaging content to our players. Now, given the timing of launches in 2018 and the continued ramp of our new initiatives, we expect our performance to be further weighted to the back half of the year relative to what we saw in 2017. We expect Blizzard to grow year over year with the release of World of Warcraft's Battle for Azeroth this summer. I'm, I'm glad to say the pre-sales for Azeroth kicked off last week and are off to an encouraging start. In addition, Blizzard has exciting plans for live ops and additional in-game content across franchises, including Hearthstone's three expansions in 2018 and Overwatch's in-game events. Blizzard will also start to see the benefit of its investment initiatives as we expect the Overwatch League to be profitable in, 2000, in 2018, its first full year of operations. We expect Activision to grow modestly year over year, driven primarily by Call of Duty's digital season of content and the exciting new release plan for Q4. As Cotty mentioned, Activision and Bungie are hard at work on Destiny 2 to improve end game engagement through regular updates and events, which we anticipate will benefit performance later this year with the release of a new expansion in May and a major expansion in the second half of the year. And we expect King to be up year over year, driven by ongoing live operations across the portfolio and two or more new releases during the year, including Social Casino. As we've indicated on prior calls, we'll begin to ramp our ads business in 2018. We expect a minor positive profit contribution weighted towards the back half of the year as we continue to roll out additional video ad products, methodically develop capabilities and infrastructure, and build the business for the significant opportunity that we see over the long term. Now turning to the numbers for guidance. On a gap basis, for 2018, we expect revenues of $7.35 billion, including gap deferrals of $100 million. We expect record net bookings of $7.45 billion. We expect product costs of 22%, operating expenses of 53%. Our gap net interest expense is expected to be $136 million, and our gap tax rate is expected to be 20%. We expect 776 million fully diluted shares, both for gap and non-gap, and gap EPS is expected to be $1.78. For 2018, on a non-gap basis, we expect product costs of 22% and operating expenses of 44%. We expect non-GAAP net interest expense of $95 million. And we expect a non-GAAP tax rate of 20%. We also expect non-GAAP EPS of $2.45, including a GAAP deferral of $0.05. Cents. Now, let's turn to our Q1 outlook. On a gap basis for Q1, we expect revenues of $1.82 billion, including gap deferrals of negative $540 million. We expect net bookings of $1.28 billion, growing year over year. We expect product costs of 20%, operating expenses of 53%, and our gap net interest expense is expected to be $30 million, our gap tax rate expected to be 20%. We expect 771 million fully diluted shares, both for GAAP and non-GAAP, and GAAP EPS is expected to be 47 cents. For Q1 on a non-GAAP basis, we expect product costs of 20%, operating expenses of 43%. We expect non-GAAP net interest expense of $29 billion, a tax, million, sorry, $29 million, a tax rate of 20%, and non-GAAP EPS of 65 cents including a gap deferral of negative 34 cents. 
In closing, in 2017, our inspired teams across Activision, Blizzard, and King demonstrated the enduring nature of our franchises. We believe the combination of leading owned IP and franchises, a direct digital connection to our consumers, best-in-class content capabilities and creative excellence, geographic platform and business model diversity, and continued fiscal discipline, focus, and business prioritization provides an incredibly powerful engine for sustained financial performance, driving meaningful growth in 2018 and beyond. Now, I welcome our business leaders, Eric, Mike, Ricardo, and Dennis, as they join us for the Q&A portion of the call. Operator? Thank you, and if you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Please limit yourself to one question. Again, that is star 1 to ask a question. Our first question comes from Chris Merwin with Goldman Sachs. All right, great. Thank you, and uh, congrats on a great great quarter and year. Um, so this one's for uh, Ricardo. We, we've seen some pretty impressive growth for King lately as you've invested in, in some more frequent content updates, and, and, and we've seen improved player engagement as a result. Uh, but beyond, I guess, the, the improvements in monetization for, for King, can you talk a bit more about the pipeline and the tour or, or more new releases in 2018 that, that you mentioned in the prepared remarks? Thank you. I agree. Uh, here's Ricardo. Um, so we have several teams working on, on new games, first of all, and those are games using the existing franchise IP as well as new, new IP. So we're creating also new IP. And these games are at various stages of production, and it's a multi-year pipeline. So as you heard before, in uh, 2018, we plan to release at least two new games, uh, including Social Casino in partnership with Play Studios. I would like to highlight that we set ourselves a very high bar for new game launches. We will only launch games of the highest quality, and we will only launch them when they're ready. When we think about games pipeline, <clears throat> it's not just about new games. It's also new content for our existing live games where we develop new features and live ops. In uh, 2017, we focused these developments on increasing engagement and increasing monetization. And this has allowed us to hit several mobile bookings milestones. As we heard earlier, we had in uh, Q3 our highest ever mobile bookings quarter and in Q4, we hit our highest ever mobile booking week. In 2018, we will continue focusing on engagement and monetization, but we will also focus these new features on reach initiatives. So we expect to continue to drive positive engagement and monetization, as well as we expect to attract new users. So if, if I think about it, we exited, we exited 2017 with a strong momentum, and I believe that we have a great pipeline, both of new titles and new content for our live games. Okay. Okay. Operator? We'll take our next question from Laura Martin with Needham. Uh, good afternoon. Um, let's talk about the Overwatch League. Sounds like everything's going great. Could you sort of give us an update on how it did benchmark against your expectations and what surprised you both on the upside and downside? And then on the monetization as we're modeling 2018, you said you're going to sell some more teams. Could you talk about monetization generally and then whether you think the teams will sell for more than the first 12 teams? Thanks. Hi, thanks. This is Mike from Blizzard. Um, first off, I want to take a moment to thank everyone on the Overwatch League team for the amazing job they've done. Overwatch League was an ambitious undertaking. It required support and collaboration across Activision Blizzard, starting from the Overwatch game team all the way up to Bobby, who, as you know, has been a strong supporter of the League from the beginning, um, as well as from a host of stakeholders in the community. I want to especially thank all the pro players who compete the team owners who really got behind our vision for the league, our partners over at Twitch, and our sponsors who believed in what we were building. 
Um, I want to also thank the viewers who tune in, especially those people who are coming to the studio and bringing their passion and energy and filling up the stands. Um, they're an inspiration to everyone who works on Overwatch League. It's really been wonderful to see how everything has worked out so far. We're very pleased with the high quality production that we have uh, been able to enjoy every week. The games have been exciting to watch and the reception from our viewers has been really spectacular. So, so far, everything has either met or exceeded our expectations. We made a landmark two-year media rights deal with Twitch and more than 10 million people tuned in to week one worldwide. We had an impressive audience um, per minute of over 400,000 on opening day. Um, we've also been very happy that several major brands have partnered with Overwatch League, uh, including Intel, HP, Toyota, T-Mobile, and Sour Patch Kids. Um, while we're pleased, it's important to note that this is only the beginning. Our focus is going to be on continued growth of the audience through improvements to the broadcast and the live viewer experience. In the mid to long term, we think that audience growth is the key to seeing impact um, both to the bottom line results and to the company as, as a whole, and I think also to uh, drive popularity in the game as well. In terms of uh, you know, selling expansion teams, we're very excited with the reaction and, and the interest in expansion teams, and I'm pretty confident to say that the price is going to go up. Operator? We'll take our next question from Matthew Thornton with SunTrust. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Um, maybe one for, for Eric on, uh, on Destiny 2. Can you, can you kind of give us a little more color just on the trends you're seeing around player engagement, uh, in-game monetization, and then again a little more color just about how you're thinking about the, the game and the plans for, for 2018. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. I'm happy to talk about Destiny 2. And I want to start just by putting it all in context because we did have a very successful launch of the game. Uh, as Cotty mentioned, it was the number two game in North America, the number four game globally, and it was also very well received. Uh, it had an 87 rating. That was a full 10 points uh, of improvement over Destiny 1, and it received 120 awards and nominations. And on top of that, we saw very positive sentiment and new franchise high levels of engagement for the first couple of months post-launch. Now, after that, meaning after players had poured you know, a significant amount of hours already into the game, we have definitely seen some real sentiment issues surface in a couple of areas, and we've got plans to address those. For example, um, one of the things we wanted to do with Destiny 2 was to make the game a little bit less of a grind based on the feedback we had heard, and we also want to provide players with more direct paths to getting the game's best rewards, and that actually allowed our core players to consume the content faster than we anticipated, and that has led to an increase in players calling for more challenges and better rewards in the ongoing game. Now, this is a live game, and responding to player feedback is a part of the process in this game and any live game, and we feel we have the right plans in place to address the concerns. Um, last week, uh, Bungie po uh, posted a detailed roadmap of the changes that we have coming over the next several months, and thus far those plans have been very well received, as have the changes that we've already put into the game itself already, and the sentiment is already starting to shift. And also remember that we have a great expansion coming in May and a major expansion coming at the end of the year. And those events have always been opportunities for us to re-engage our community and win back people who have churned out. Um, this is a, an incredibly passionate group of players. And that passion is a good thing, even when the sentiment is critical, because it shows how deeply people care about the game. And we think that's one of the things that makes this a great franchise. And we're fully committed to listening to and communicating with our community more frequently and more transparently than ever and making the right changes to improve the experience. And we think we have the right path forward. We'll take our next question from Tim O'Shea with Jeffries. Um, yes, hi, thank you for taking my question. So, um, Cotty touched on this in, his, in the opening remarks, but I wanted to get a better sense for where Call of Duty finished the year in terms of full game downloads. And then maybe if you could give us a little color on, on what your expectations are uh, going forward. Thank you. Uh, great, this is Ben. Thank, thanks for the question, Tim. Um, See, so yeah, as you recall, I, I mentioned last quarter that we're seeing this consumer-led shift to full game downloads in our console business. 
it's similar to what we've already experienced in the games business on PC platforms, and, and of course, digital transition is, is not unique to gaming. It's, it's impacting pretty much every form of entertainment consumption. So now the good news for us is, as I also discussed last call, is it's, it's good for our business. It brings us closer to our consumer and with better economics. So uh, with that context, Call of Duty finished the year at about a 30% digital mix. And we mentioned last year that our digital mix was about 20 to 25% on Call of Duty. So this year's performance, it's, it's essentially in line, actually, a bit, of a, a bit of an acceleration in that historical five percentage point increase we've been seeing the past few years. And I should underscore that uh, these are big, absolute numbers when we're talking about Call of Duty because it's such a mass market game. You know, as Cotty mentioned, Call of Duty World War II is the biggest day one digital release ever for PlayStation. And in aggregate, it, uh, it represented the biggest Activision digital title ever released on console. Um, and, you know, as we look forward, Tim, I, we'd expect the mix shift in 2018 to be similar to what we saw for Call of Duty this year. It's obviously a bit tough to predict with certainty given that it's ultimately consumer driven. But I know that our teams are, you know, they're going to continue to innovate with compelling digital offers and other strategies that deliver value to the community. And they'll also continue to support our, our, our important retail partners. So, you know, overall, the trends remain strong. They're positive for our business. And, and the good news is we've got quite a bit of a uh, of runway ahead of us. Operator? Up next, we have Mike Olson with Piper Jeffrey. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, and thanks for taking my question. I just have one. You, you talked about uh, the opportunity for the actual league, but could you talk about the Overwatch League impact on Overwatch, the game itself, as it relates to engagement, monetization, and or core game sales? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, this is Mike again. Um, the Overwatch League has increased overall engagement with the franchise between viewership and gameplay when you consider the hundreds of thousands of fans watching each match and average watch time of over an hour each night. Um, we're tapping into a whole new avenue for players to uh, express their passion for Overwatch. Of course, um, there are other positives for the game overall. Um, the Overwatch League has driven a ton of buzz and awareness for the game. And so as that increases, um, our players have new ways to customize their playing experience with in-game digital skins as well as physical merchandise. Um, and we've seen our players respond well to both of those. Um, we're also looking forward to launching additional initiatives to tie the viewing experience better with the play experience. We think that over the long term, um, the league will bring in new players as people see the excitement around the league and may even start to train to become the next pro player. Outside of the league, we have additional plans to keep Overwatch fresh and, and players engaged. We already released a new map called Blizzard World in January. We have the Lunar New Year event launching today, and there's additional plans um, later this year for new heroes and seasonal events to come out as well. Operator? Thank you. Our, our next question comes from Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Hi, this is Brandon Hoffman on for Brian Nowak. Um, so you had strong performance from Call of Duty World War II uh, and there's excitement about digital in 2018. Can you talk a bit about the COD pipeline going forward? Thank you. Absolutely, the COD pipeline is one of my favorite topics. Um, before we talk about World War II, uh, I, I think it's worth stepping back and talking about how pleased we are with uh, the state of the Call of Duty franchise overall. Obviously, Call of Duty World War II was the number one console video game in the world in 2017. And that makes Call of Duty the number one franchise in the world eight of the last nine years. And Call of Duty World War II also delivered the biggest launch quarter we've seen on current generation consoles, even higher than Black Ops 3, as I think Cotty mentioned. And engagement on World War II has also been strong. Not quite as strong as we've seen from the Black Ops franchise, which of course has been our stickiest games, but we have seen strong participation with our first uh, two seasonal events, the Winter Siege and the Resistance, and we have actually a more robust calendar of those types of events in the game uh, than we've ever had before. So our strategy of bringing Call of Duty content to whatever game our fans are choosing to play is really continuing to pay off because also in 2017 we saw that in Black Ops 3, the Zombies Chronicles uh, piece was the number one 
top selling add-on content on PlayStation last year, which is you know, all the more remarkable given that it was released almost two years after the launch of the original game. So that, of course, sets the stage for the game we have planned uh, later this year, which is being developed by our, by our team at Treyarch. Now, as you know, they uh, have developed some of our most successful games ever, and they've proven time, again, time and again that they know how to keep our players engaged uh, for the long haul. So overall, I'd say our strategy for Call of Duty is, is working. You know, World War II is a blockbuster. We've got a thriving Black Ops community um, who's excited for the upcoming Treyarch-developed game. And I, I honestly really wish I could say more about what we have in the pipeline because I'm so excited about it. But suffice it to say, I think we have the best three-year slate in Call of Duty's history, which is really saying something given this franchise's history. And I think we've got multiple different game universes uh, that we know our players love on tap. So obviously more to come on that. Our next question comes from Eric Sheridan with UBS. Thanks for taking the question. I want to know if you could talk a little bit about some of the moves you've made, whether it be investments, acquisitions, uh, to position the company for the advertising opportunity across King. And then maybe the second one would be, how do you think about extending those capabilities or assets across other brands or platforms of the company uh, in, in the coming years? Thanks so much. Hi, Eric. It's uh, Ricardo here. Advertising for us is a strategic focus given the opportunity we have with our large and engaged audience. So we are prioritizing investments across multiple areas. First of all, we are building a world-class team. And we are investing in our teams on several dimensions, on the ad product, in engineering, in sales, and in analytics. And we have already people in place, and this year we plan to scale these teams further. Second, we are investing in creating great ad products. And by that I mean ad experiences that resonate with our highly engaged players and that are well integrated into the gameplay and also deliver real value to our advertisers. So to get this right, we have embedded the ad teams within our game teams, including in Candy. So third, we're investing in our own ad tech infrastructure. In 2017, we've seen early success with a dozen of global brands buying advertising across a number of territories in five different games. And we have seen repeat buys as a result of the strong completion and viewability metrics. In 2018, as you heard Spence earlier, we are expecting only a modest bottom line contribution from ads as we plan to ramp the video ads opportunity and as we continue to invest in the significant, uh, in the, in the significant opportunity for the long term. For the, for the second part of the question, I will hand over to, to Cody. Okay, thanks Ricardo, uh, and thanks for the question, Eric. I, I think first, um, you have to step back and, and know that we have several key initiatives underway where building out capability in one area of the business enables flexibility and option value to bring that capability to other areas of the business over time. You know, Overwatch League could be a great example of this, where the focus now is completely and solely on Overwatch success. But over time, the professional city-based league approach, the infrastructure, the know-how, the team, the processes, the support structure, could logically go on to support other franchises that have strong esports momentum. And, and so that's sort of broadly the way we think about some of these areas. And advertising, we think, is, a, is another good example of this. And for ads specific, specifically, I think we, we have the opportunity probably in a couple of areas that are worth unpacking. The first and foremost one is the opportunity that Ricardo just spoke to. Ads for the King Mobile Network is our primary focus right now. It's the first step in building out internal ad products, tech stack, uh, team and infrastructure. But second, uh, we do have a, a near-term opportunity to bring relevant advertising to our esports audiences. We're already off to a good start there with Overwatch League media rights, sponsorships, uh, advertiser interest, but we see further opportunity in our own MLG platform. And over time, third, there could be opportunities in other areas of the company, particularly as we explore ad-based experiences across new games that are suited to that form of media. 
you know, if you, if, you, if you then just step all the way back, we have over 50 minutes of engagement per day in our games right now, and that's not yet including all the time spent watching gameplay in our franchises. So we think there's a, we think there's a pretty compelling opportunity to do what you said, which is to be able to bring advertising to other brands and platforms uh, across our network. Our, ne our next question comes from Evan Wingren with KeyBank. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is from Mike. I was just wondering, what are your expectations for, for World of Warcraft, Battle for Azeroth, in terms of the size, engagement, or, or any other innovation in the game um, for this expansion? Thanks for the question. Um, so at Blizzard, you know, we always get excited about new launches, and you know, we, in addition to our players, are very excited about Battle for Azeroth's features, uh, which include new allied races, to give players even more character customization options. Um, players who pre-ordered the expansion have been enjoying early access to some of the allied races already, and that has helped drive early pre-orders. Pre We're very pleased with the results so far. Um, Battle for Azeroth also includes uh, two huge continents for players to explore, as well as some new gameplay modes. Warfront is a new cooperative mode where players will band together in massive battles inspired by Warcraft's RTS roots. And the Island Expeditions mode will, will include randomized elements for small groups to enjoy with great replayability, which you know, is very important in a game like World of Warcraft. Content always drives engagement. So just like we did with Legion, we're planning a steady stream of content after launch to maintain engagement. As for what's ahead in 2018 with Battle for Azeroth, we're looking forward to sharing more in the months to come and releasing the expansion this summer. There's a ton of buzz right now in the community and at Blizzard. The team's very excited about this expansion. And our last question comes from Colin Sebastian with Robert, Robert Baird. Uh, thanks, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, I guess I just wanted some clarification on, on where development stands for some of the, the new mobile titles in the pipeline, uh, not only in King, which I think was already addressed, but, but across uh, Blizzard and Activision, uh, following up on, on some of the announcements on, on personnel last year, perhaps. Thank you very much. Yeah, hey, Colin, this is Cotty. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so you're right, yeah, I'd, I'd probably break the mobile efforts and new games into two buckets. Um, the first you mentioned, which is the ongoing efforts at King on their mobile pipeline. It, it's just worth highlighting again, they, they are taking a very focused approach to development. Um, and as mentioned, you know, expect to have two or more new releases during the year. In addition to the ongoing updates inside their existing live games, which really are just in the live games, initiatives in and of themselves that drive new players and bring in um, new audiences. Uh, so there's, as you know, and as we speak to a lot, there's real focus there. But the second opportunity is to take our, our very successful PC and console franchises and extend them to mobile. And we think this is the time to do it, and it's an exciting opportunity for a few reasons. First, mobile gaming is, of course, you know, now very much at scale, large and growing, with billions of people around the world who essentially have a mini console or PC in their pocket. It's kind of the second reason that the technology, we feel, has advanced to the point where we feel there's a mobile platform now that can fulfill the requirements of our core IP. Um, there's also for us, we think, a really important opportunity in Asia where we already have some of the most successful non-mobile franchises. And as you know, many of the top mobile games there now are, are based on existing console or, I, or PC IP. That was their roots in console and PC, and they've moved to mobile. And you know, we think there's an opportunity for us as well over time to explore our IP on mobile uh, in that region. We obviously want to get this right. We want to do it well at super high quality for our players and audiences who matter a great deal to us. So it takes investment and time. But we do plan to see some early results later this year from our mobile investments, and we expect more meaningful impact in 2019 and beyond. So uh, we're working hard on the pipeline, uh, and, and we will have more news to share down the road. Okay. I think that was the last question, right? So, uh, well, thank, every, thank you all for, uh, for, for joining the call today. We appreciate it. We appreciate your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing or speaking with you and speaking with you over the next few weeks.